This is the new 2022 Mazda MX-30, and it's the weirdest car on sale. I'm not exaggerating. Everything about this car is weird. It looks weird. It has weird doors. The interior is bizarre. It has incredibly strange pricing and market positioning, and it's tremendously limited production. Nothing about this car is ordinary in any way. And today, I'm going to review the MX-30 and show show you what I mean. Before I get started, be sure to check out Cars and Bids, which is my enthusiast car auction website for cool cars from the modern era, now with free listings. You can list your car for free and auction it on Cars and Bids. And you should, because we've had some great sales recently, including this fantastic E63 AMG sedan, which sold for just over $40,000, this amazing six-door Ford Super Duty excursion conversion thing, which brought $96,000. $6,000, and this fantastic BMW 328i wagon, which brought $27,000. We've done fantastically with wagons on cars and bids. Anyway, if you're looking to buy or sell a cool enthusiast car from the modern era, the 1980s and up, Cars and Bids is the place to do it. Check it out at carsandbids.com. So let's talk MX-30. First off, this is intended to be a small crossover, even though it isn't offered with all-wheel drive. That's one weird thing. It's also fully electric. This is Mazda's first ever electric car, but it only has a driving range of around 100 miles. That's another weird thing, especially when you consider the starting price of the MX-30 is around $35,000. Yes, that's right. This only only goes 100 miles between electric charges, and it starts at $35,000 before options. Just for some context, the Chevy Bolt is cheaper than this, and it can go more than twice as far with its electric range. I suspect that's not going to be good for sales, but then again, maybe Mazda doesn't really care all that much about sales. For its first model year, the MX-30 is only going to be sold in California, although national sales will come later. But for the first model year, it's incredibly limited production. Mazda says they're only going to make 560 of these, meaning the first model year MX-30 will be about as rare as a Ferrari Enzo, even though that is a limited production hypercar, and this is an electric compact crossover. See, I told you this thing was weird, and today I'm going to review it. First, I'll take you on a thorough tour of the MX-30 and show you all of its bizarre and very unusual quirks and features. Then I'll get it out on the road and drive it, and then I'll give it a Doug score. All right, I'm going to start the quirks and features of the MX-30 by discussing the doors, which are just one of many, many bizarre things about this car. Let's start with the front door. You open it up and you can see it opens all the way, 90 degrees, which is very unusual for a car front door. Usually they stop somewhere like this, not in the MX-30, it opens all the way. And the reason for that is the rear door is rear hinged. You open it like this. Yeah. Yes, this has rear hinged rear doors like the Mazda RX-8, the BMW i3, the Toyota FJ Cruiser, rear hinged rear doors. And you can see now why the front door has to open so wide, because if it opened to a normal spot, there wouldn't really be all that much room to climb in and out, but opening this wide gives you more space to get inside. Still, rear hinged rear doors, you don't see these all that often, and there are several good reasons for that. For one thing, if you're sitting in back with a door like this, you can't open the back door until you've opened the front door, because the rear door actually serves as the latch for the front door. So the front door won't close unless the rear door is in place, and the rear door won't open unless the front door is already open. And that means if you're sitting in the back of this car and you want to get out, you got to ask the front seat person nicely, can you, can you please open your door so I can climb out? 
which kind of defeats the purpose of having four doors in the first place. Also a drawback, you can't roll down this back window. If you're sitting in back of this car, you're kind of just stuck back there with no window to roll down, no extra airflow. Now, with that said, Mazda has cleverly solved one big drawback of the Toyota FJ Cruiser and its rear opening doors, and that would be visibility. Behind the FJ's doors, there's no window. It's just a big panel and you can't see anything out of it. Well, behind the MX-30's doors, you do have an extra window for extra visibility visibility, which is a smart idea, so visibility isn't really an issue. Unfortunately, on that extra window, they've mounted a decal that has the word electric printed on it on both sides, which strikes me as just a desperate attempt to communicate to the public that this car is electric. No, please, even us Mazda, we're joining the electric car world too, CC, look at our decal, look at our decal. <laughs> it's, it's just kind of silly, to be honest. Now, with that said, also to Mazda's credit, one other thing they did right, when a front door opens 90 degrees, it can be very difficult to close it from the inside. You get inside, you gotta reach all the way out. Well, Mazda figured that would be a problem, so they mounted the door pull really far forward on the door. It doesn't really require a longer reach than any other car, even though it opens all the way. That was pretty smart design. But as weird as the doors are, the interior materials might be even stranger. Mazda intended to use some environmentally friendly materials materials in keeping with this car's electric theme. And so you can see on the door panel, this cloth piece is actually a recycled material and it looks and feels kind of cool. And I like the idea of using recycled materials in an interior, but that's not the weird one. The weird one is the amount of cork in this interior. Yes, cork. You can see it right here in the center console in the storage area. This is cork like you would see on a bulletin board or a wine cork. There it is in the center console of this car and it runs up to the kind of upper center console area too. More cork in this interior. And they also used cork on the grab handle to close the door. On the inside of it, you're feeling cork when you close the door. Very unusual material. Mazda says this is a throwback to the brand's early days. Mazda got started as a cork manufacturer in 1920s Japan, and so they incorporated cork into this car as kind of a celebration of its roots. Very strange, never seen cork in an interior before. And the cork here in the center console has kind of an interesting function. In its normal state, it operates as a cover for the cup holders in case you don't want to see them, which is fairly standard. But you can see right behind that, you have the center console lid, and it doesn't have like a front until you lift up the cork. You lift up the cork cup holder covers and then you have an extra side in your center console storage area so you can store more stuff in there. Or you can put them back down and then you have all of your cork on display for your passengers to see and undoubtedly ask you about. And speaking of rather unusual things in this interior, in the center, let's move on to the gear lever, which of course is bizarre. Weird car, weird gear lever as it always goes. Now right now it's in park and it's sort of up and to the left. You want it to go into a reverse, you move it to the right, and now it's up and to the right and you're in reverse, and you pull it back for drive, and it's down and to the right, and it has all of those available positions. It's a little strange, but the really weird part is you can turn this car off when the gear lever is in drive and walk away. The car car will automatically put itself into park, but the gear lever won't move positions. Meaning the next time you come into the car to start it, it makes you shift into park first, and then you can start it, and then you can shift back into drive. In my Land Rover, if you leave the shift lever in sport mode, which is pushed off to the side and turn off the car, it automatically pops itself back into park. Not here. The car will go into park, but the shift lever won't, and then you have to do it yourself the next time you get in. Strange operation. Now, next up, another interesting quirk. Below this center console, you can see all this cork like I showed you before. This is a little storage area. Mazda calls this their floating center console. It brings all the important stuff closer to you and gives you extra storage beneath it. And it's kind of a cool feature. You don't see it all that often. Also mounted below the center console area, you can see several different charge ports, a few USBs. But the really cool thing here is a household style plug, which you don't often see in the front seat of a car. But you have that here, which can add some practicality. You can work on 
a laptop as the passenger while the driver is driving, and that's a cool touch to have up in front. Now, next up, also in the center console area, this time next to the gear lever, you have a touch screen here, which is purely for your climate controls. This is not used for anything else, just your climate controls, your touch screen. Now, strangely enough, they have hard buttons for most of the vital climate control functions directly next to the climate touch screen. You can see air temperature, air speed, that sort of thing, but the rest of your climate controls are integrated into this screen. So turning on or off the heated seats, for example, or changing the direction of the airflow, that's all in the screen. Now, personally, I kind of like this climate screen. It's very simple, very easy to use, near where your hands are, and it's intuitive and responds directly to your touch instantaneously. It's all pretty simple, and it's not used for anything else, like I said, meaning you'll never glance at this screen and find that you have to press several different buttons to go back to your climate menu. It's all always just sitting right there, so it's basically as good as having hard buttons. The weird thing, though, is that Mazda has remained pretty committed to not doing touchscreens. I've sat through many Mazda presentations where they talked about how touchscreens are less safe than non-touchscreens, and so it's kind of odd to see Mazda specifically doing this for the climate controls, but that's what they've done. However, they have made sure not to have a touchscreen for the infotainment system, which I have always felt is a mistake. Mazda and I are kind of at odds about this. You have this center controller here next to the gear lever, and that controls this screen mounted way up on the dashboard. Now, Mazda has told me the reason they do this is they believe this is safer than a touchscreen because you don't have to take your eyes very far off the road. You can operate this little wheel just driving along with your hand on the wheel without really looking too far away, unlike a touchscreen which takes your eyes off the road for longer and it has to be closer to your body in order for you to use it. The problem, though, is, at least for me, the touchscreen is just easier to use. Using a dial and a screen far away requires several different steps and coordination of things. The touchscreen may pull your eyes further off the road, but it seems like it's just easier to use. We're also used to touchscreens with our smartphone, and you don't have to try to coordinate between a dial and a screen that's kind of far away. At least, that's my opinion. Now, speaking of screens, there's one other in this interior, and that would be in the gauge cluster, where you have this center screen here that can display various different functions. You can have it in this setting, which shows the car shown on a road, and you can see your safety features kind of displayed around you as you use them. Or you can go back to a default screen, which is actually a speedometer, if you want to have that right in the center instead of like a digital speed readout. Those are your options for gauges. Now, a couple of quirky things in this gauge cluster. One, I love the fact that when the rear doors are open, the warning light actually mimics the shape and size of the rear doors. <laughs> that looks wonderfully cool. Also interesting in this gauge cluster, the gauge on the left, not a tachometer, of course, it wouldn't really make sense in an electric car. Instead, it's a gauge showing charge and power. So if you floor it, it goes into the power mode, but if you get on the brakes and regen is being used, it goes into the charge mode since it's charging the battery, which is, I guess, pretty reasonable. Another interesting gauge in here, Mazda has decided to use the typical fuel gauge to show the current state of electric charge. You can see here they've just taken the fuel gauge off a gas-powered Mazda and stuck it in this one. It's an unusual adaptation. Most cars show your electric charge with some like futuristic digital gauge, but not here, just your standard fuel gauge. Of course, the center screen in the gauge cluster also shows exactly how many miles of range you have left, but you can also see it here on kind of a repurposed fuel gauge. But anyway, next up we climb into the back of the MX-30 using the strange rear door. You open it up and you get back here and quickly discover there's not a lot of room. Oh in the back of the MX-30. It's just really not all that big here. I have the front seat positioned where I would sit, and you can see I'm tight back here. My knees are right up against the front seat, and sitting up here, I can't completely sit up straight. My head is right up against the ceiling. It's not really all that spacious if you want adults both in the front and in the back. Not really the vehicle for that task. And there are some other drawbacks to the rear seat, including how tight it is back here. For one, it's pretty claustrophobic. You can't put the windows down, and the door panels are pretty large, so the windows that do exist aren't all that big. It really feels kind of tight, and then the roof is encroaching because it has this sloped roof line, and you just feel a little a lot claustrophobic in back, frankly. Now, speaking of the door panel, even the rear doors use the same cool recycled cloth material as the front ones do. You can see it here, and that again looks pretty nice, although Mazda cheaped out on the cork. There is no cork in the back seat, including on the rear door grab handle. They integrated that cork into the front door grab handle, but not in back. I guess they deem that an unnecessary application of cork. 
and so they didn't put it there. With that said, they didn't completely cheap out back here. The materials are reasonably nice, and I especially like this leather armrest on the sides of the rear seat, which looks good, uses this high-quality brown leather, and it's a nice place to just rest your arm. Now, speaking of armrest back here, there's also a center armrest. If you don't want to use the middle seat, you can put that down and you get some cup holders, which are a nice feature back here, but there aren't really any other amenities. There are no charge ports for rear passengers, so you can't charge your devices back here, and there's no climate control vents, so the claustrophobia and you can't roll down your rear windows, that's not solved with like extra air for the rear passengers. Again, you're kind of dependent on the people in the front. Now, I will say, although I've been mostly critical of the back seat back here, and especially the rear seat room, I climbed in on the driver's side, and it's actually easier to get into the back of the MX-30 on the passenger side because there's this little loop at the base of the seat that you can pull, and then you can throw the front seat forward in order to create more room to get into the back seat. But who wants to do that in a four-door car? The whole point of having four doors is you can just climb into the back seats without having to move the front seat at all, but in this car, that's really the only comfortable way to get into the back. Now, strangely enough, if you're sitting behind the driver's driver in the back seat, you have two switches mounted on the back of the driver's seat that allow you to control the driver's seat. You press the switches and you can move the seat back or the entire seat forward or backward, which is kind of strange. I hope they lock these out when the car is in drive so rear passengers don't distract the driver by playing with the seat, but that is the easiest way to move the seat forward and climb out of the back seat if you're sitting here on the driver's side. And next up, we move around to the back of the MX-30 into the cargo area area, you pop open the tailgate and you can see there's a fairly decently sized cargo area back here, at least from a floor perspective. The problem is because of the sloping roof line in this car, if you want to put something really big back here, you're facing a bit of a penalty. You may not be able to get it in without putting down the rear seats, which is kind of disappointing, but there's decent space. And you can see there are tethers back here for the charger bag. This bag contains the charger that comes with the car and you can tether it to the side of your cargo area so you don't lose it or misplace it somewhere. To me though, probably the most interesting thing about the entire cargo area is at the base of the tailgate, you have a lock button. You press that button and then close the tailgate and the doors will lock. I see this feature frequently in cars that have power tailgates. You press the lock button, the tailgate closes automatically and the doors lock, but I've never seen it before in a car with a manual tailgate. You can lock the doors from this button and then slam the tailgate closed and the doors lock. That's a pretty nice touch for a car with a manual tailgate. But anyway, back to charging for a second. I mentioned earlier the bag in the cargo area with the charger cable, well, this is where you plug it in to this massive fuel door looking thing on the rear fender. It really is huge, but you just tap it and it pops open and then you can plug in your charger here and charge up your MX-30. But still a rather large fuel door. And this door is mounted right below the Mazda script on the side of this car. You can see Mazda printed in a classy font on what looks like aluminum, although it's actually plastic. It's not quite that classy, although maybe it should be for for $35,000, but anyway, kind of a weird little touch on the outside. And frankly, there are a lot of weird design choices on the outside of this car. I don't find the MX-30 to be particularly attractive. It has kind of a long front end, but it's also a stubby little car with this weird sloping back. It kind of looks like a coupe SUV that didn't really work properly. Frankly, the whole design reminds me of the Alfa Romeo SZ. I reviewed the Roadster version of that, but the SZ, which was known to be kind of ugly, shares the same overall profile as the MX-30, I don't think this car's design will exactly do it any favors for people interested in an electric car. To me, it just looks a little weird. With that said, one design touch I do love on the outside of this car is the turn signals. Not only the way the brake lights and turn signals are shaped in back, I think that looks pretty good, but when you put on the turn signals, they flash on and then dim quietly. Flash on and dim. I really like the look of this, and it just goes and goes, and it's a distinctive Mazda thing and it looks cool. Same deal in front. The front signals do the same thing. Flash on and then dim in front. Again, distinctive to Mazda and kind of a cool looking thing that separates this and other newer Mazda models from other normal crossovers with their normal turn signals. And next up, we move up front in the MX-30 where we discover yet another very unusual quirk. Now, pretty much every electric car I have ever reviewed has used the engine space as cargo storage because there's no massive gasoline engine under here taking up space, so you can put a little 
extra cargo area here. And surely the MX-30 must have a big cargo area under here because of its long front end. It kind of screws with the design of the car, so they must be using it for some practical purpose, right? Well, wrong. You open up the hood and you can see there's no cargo area under here at all, but there are mechanical components and then a lot of space where they could have put something. If they had just arranged the mechanical components a little differently, packaged them a little better, they could have gotten extra cargo storage under here, but they didn't for some reason. They just left a lot of empty space and you can't put anything there because there's no storage box. Again, a very strange decision for this car. I'm not sure how to even explain that one. And by the way, in my videos, this is usually the part where I talk about performance, even though it's an electric car. Let's discuss performance. Like I said, this car starts around $35,000 and it only goes 100 miles between charges. But Mazda told me the focus wasn't really on driving range, it was more on like driving experience and driving pleasure. And so I was thinking, well, great, probably has 500 horsepower and does zero to 60 in three seconds, like a lot of electric cars do these days. But instead, it has 143 horsepower and it does zero to 60 in nine point something seconds. So it's slow, it doesn't really go that far between charges, and it's pretty expensive for what you get, at least on paper. And so those are the quirks and features, the many quirks and features of the Mazda MX-30. Now it's time to get it out on the road and see how it drives. All right, here we go, driving the Mazda MX-30. Uh, and if you've been paying attention to this video, you probably have some questions like, why? What are they thinking? 35 grand, 100 miles of range and some of this weird stuff. Well, let me try to explain it a little bit. I, I sat down for like an hour long presentation from Mazda about this car and I had these same questions. And this is this is basically what they told me. For one thing, the, the price for range, Mazda's argument was, hey, most car shoppers who buy electric cars are only driving 30 miles a day. So they don't need all this range um, and so we decided to provide them with a more premium vehicle experience and, and kind of cut back a little bit on the range for sort of the same money. And then they also said, well, in addition to this more premium vehicle experience, the interior, uh, we've given kind of a car that has a more performancey feel to it. it. It feels like a more engaging, enjoyable car than a Chevy Bolt or a Hyundai Kona or, or those type of electric cars, which don't really have much, you know, performance and excitement associated with them. That's what Mazda told me. But <laughs> I have a few issues with this. And I'm gonna start with the range thing. Um, I get that most people don't need the range. And in fact, Mazda is selling this car with a program that's included with the purchase that if you buy one of these, you also get free access to a gas powered Mazda loaner car for something like 10 days a year. So if you wanna go on a drive, you know, up to see wherever family eight, 10 hours away, you don't wanna take this, you can't. You could go swap this out for a gas powered car at your Mazda dealer. And then when you're done, you bring it back and you get back into your electric car. So there's, there's that, but <laughs> that kind of defeats the purpose of having a, an electric car. You know, on a Tesla, you can go 260 miles of base Model 3. The Nissan Leaf does 248 miles or something for $30,000, $31,000. The Chevy Bolt does 260 miles for like $29,000. How do you possibly have a car go 100 miles for $35,000? It just doesn't make any sense. And as I'm sitting there listening to them tell me about this, I'm thinking of the BMW i3, which was the same principle. BMW is like, we don't need a an electric car that has this huge range, we can make a car with sustainable interior materials and a more premium, unusual experience, and people will buy that. Well, guess what? The i3 was a massive failure, and that was eight years ago that it came out and failed quickly. You'd think that you wouldn't be basing products off cars that failed <laughs> years ago. I mean, the electric car has gotten so much better since then, and that was a failure then. This is obviously going to be a failure now. I think Mazda is missing the point of why people buy vehicles. Do you think a guy with a Range Rover actually needs that off-road capability? Do you think every watch enthusiast with a GT3 actually needs that track capability? No, they buy these cars because of what they can do, what they are capable of, in case they're in that situation. And for people I know with Model 3s, if they don't, if they accidentally forget to charge the car that night, eh, whatever, you just drive the next day and charge it tomorrow. With this car, you forget to charge it one night and it's like, I'm sorry, I won't be able to make it to the office tomorrow. <laughs> My electric car is out of charge. 
It's ridiculous. And then there's the component of the driving experience. Mazda said to me, they said, look, this car, it's, it's, range was not our priority. We wanted to provide a, a better experience and a better driving experience. And, and I give Mazda the benefit of the doubt when they say stuff like that because they're good at this. They're good at driving experience. It's what they do. Only problem is this car has 143 horsepower. It does zero to 60 in the nine point something second range. It's slow. So it's not even like that aspect of the driving experience is any good. The car just is slow. And when you step on it, it feels slow. And that's hard to do in the electric car world today because so many EVs feel fast. It's so easy to make an EV fast with software and electric motors and peak torque at zero. This one isn't, even though their focus is driving performance. Now, I have to give Mazda credit in two areas specifically. One is the interior is nice in this car. There's no question about that. It's a nice place to be, and it's far nicer than interiors in similarly priced electric cars like the Chevy Bolt and like the Nissan Leaf. It's just better. For 35 grand, it's a pretty good interior. This is even better than a base Model 3 interior, Model 3 interior in general. That is true. Uh, also, from a driving perspective, the steering and handling is excellent in this car. It steers well. Um, this is probably one of the better steering compact crossovers I've driven. So overall, I've spent a lot of time thinking about this car the last few days, and I just think it's one of the most bizarre vehicles on sale today. Um, it's just not competitive. It just isn't. Uh, yeah, it's got a nice interior, and yeah, the steering and handling is good, but that doesn't make up for the tight back seat, the, the lack of range, the kind of strange styling in my opinion, no front cargo area, the poor acceleration, horsepower numbers of this car. I mean, there's so many drawbacks here, it's just a little disappointing. So why was why did they even make it? I mean, I kind of wonder about that. There is a MX-30 that was being sold in foreign markets, and I think Mazda was just so eager to enter the electric game here in the States, they just had brought it over and just kind of had to do it. But this is not a compelling car, in my opinion, for a lot of reasons. I think if it was 12, 15 grand cheaper, maybe then, but it would have to really be at that 20 grand price point to compel me to start to really think about it. Mazda says they're only gonna sell 560 of these and only in California for the 22 model year. Honestly, I think they're gonna have trouble selling that many. A plug-in hybrid version is on the way that will have a gas engine backup which should extend the range. That will probably be more compelling. But for right now, it's a bizarre decision to make this car, bizarre decision to sell it in its current state, and I just don't see how people choose this over a lot of other competition. And so that's the Mazda MX-30, truly the strangest vehicle on sale right now with weird styling and a weird interior and weird doors and weird everything else, including the price tag. Fortunately, Mazda has pretty low expectations for sales for this vehicle, which I think is a good thing because I suspect sales are gonna be pretty slow. Anyway, now it's time to give the MX-30 a Doug score. And the Doug score is here, 42 out of 100, and here's how it compares to other electric vehicles and relevant cars. Almost dead last. Folks, I like Mazda, and I like most Mazda models, but this one just isn't good. Range is horrible, which would be okay if it was cheap, but it isn't, and the low range might be okay if it had great performance, but it doesn't. The Mazda MX-30 honestly and truly reminds me of the Cadillac ELR, an early attempt at an electric vehicle without much knowledge of how demand will be and what people will want, except the ELR came out a decade ago before most other electric cars. The MX-30 is debuting now to a crowded field of electric cars, and it offers no major selling points against the competition. I predict the MX-30 will be a massive flop unless Mazda makes major changes to the price, performance, or range. Ah!